Empire created a global playground for the wealthy, but the rest of society right across the classes decided they wanted a slice too. And that transformed the fortunes of one town in particular. The pleasure palaces of Blackpool have seen their ups and downs. They owe their existence, though, to the desire by Lancashire's textile workers who were driving the economic engine of empire to get a slice of that imperial pomp and opulence for themselves. And that led to a kind of entertainment arms race here beside the seaside. The tower attractions versus the winter gardens. It offered a spectacular escape from day-to-day -day life in a mill town, with fabulous architecture and decor influenced by the foreign and exotic. It plugged into the zeitgeist and proved a ruthlessly efficient way of parting visitors from their money. Hi, Carl. Hi, Stuart. Nice I've come to meet Carl Carrington, Blackpool's heritage manager. Tell me about this struggle that was going on in Blackpool. Well, of course, the Golden Mile wasn't called the Golden Mile because of the beach. It was because of the sheer amount of money you could make here. So, basically, these two companies were constantly vying right. to get bigger numbers of visitors, make more money, both big For private companies. Yes. Indeed. The Winter Gardens opened in 1878. The rival tower complex opened in 1894. And both sides added attractions in a tit-for-tat war lasting decades. And during Wakes Week's holidays, visitors by the tens of thousands were lured in by a promise of the exotic. There's a huge market of working class people. Indeed, and of course those working class people were working in, in Lancashire mills, weaving cotton. Countries like India were exporting their raw material yeah. to Lancashire, we were weaving it and selling it back to Empire. This is where the money was coming from and it enabled all of those working class households to have holidays in places like Blackpool. And what was it, Carl, these people were coming to see and do? Well, let me take you on a whistle-stop tour. Great. First stop sounds promising, the Indian Lounge. But this feels like a modern nightclub, Carl. Well, this isn't what it used to look like. It was an incredible celebration of yeah. everything Indian. It looked like the throne room of an Indian Maharaja, incredibly elaborate. But, of course, it, that was actually part of the appetite of tourists at the time. Yeah. They wanted the exotic, they wanted the different. It looks amazing, so why, why rip it out? What happened? Well, that was part of a move towards offering a more contemporary sort of feel to the complex. Mm. There was much more of a sense of wanting to look forward after the war rather than back to history as part of the town's yeah. entertainment. The wealthy weren't only heading to the colonies. European travel was all the rage. This is an amazing room. <laughs> and Spanish, by the looks of things, yeah? Yes, this is the Spanish Hall. Those people that were making money from Empire that were actually visiting places like Spain and Italy on holiday, and, you know, their workers wanted a piece of that. God, this is an enormous place, never-ending spaces. Yep, and here we are in the Empress Ballroom, which is the biggest of our spaces. And the Empress that it's named after is Victoria. Yes, of course, Empress of India, Empress of the rest of the Empire as well. The ballroom and the whole Winter Gardens has been bought by the council, who are spending £54 million doing it up. When it opened in 1896, two years after the tower, it was at the heart of the battle for visitors. When the tower was built, they then built this. It was directly to, to offset the fact that they had a ballroom and this building didn't. So, of course, what then happened is the tower refurbished again in a much more elaborate style. So you, that's the way the competition sort of went back and fro Before. over the years. Make no mistake, the tower meant business. Two and a half thousand tonnes of iron, steel and bravado, an unmistakable landmark and immediate hit with Victorian visitors. Time to get the inside track on its unique lineup of attractions. So here we are in Blackpool Tower, yeah. which of course is a great rival of the Winter Gardens. You've got yeah. these incredible panels of exotic birds. Lovely tiles, yeah. Which refer really to the Free Fire aviary, which was on the roof, in the rooftop really? gardens. Oh, really? And of course they had a menagerie as well. Tucked behind the scenes, awaiting restoration, other touches of the foreign and exotic. Are you ready for this? I think so. This is the big one. Oh, my. 
Well, this is spectacular. Welcome to Blackpool Tower Ballroom. The tower sees itself as the spiritual home of ballroom dancing. Visitors still come almost daily for afternoon tea and a glide across the huge dance floor. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And one of the interesting things is that, you know, this features on the Strictly Final every year, but yeah. you don't really see the ballroom. There's a big set in here, so yeah. you're not actually you seeing see all this incredible this, space. Which is a shame. It's amazing. But it's not India or Africa or Tigers or Empire like that. It's more European here. Yes, this is, this is modelled on the Opera Garnier in Paris, so it's an extension of that desire to have a little bit of that life that the rich had, working-class people being able to enjoy Absolutely. that. But you did mention tigers, so if you'd like to follow me... Great. Ah, no, this is amazing. Yep, welcome to Blackpool Tower Circus. So you are now right at the heart of the tower. Yeah, underneath it directly, here's the four legs and there's the base of the tower, amazing. Yeah. The circus has run every season since 1894. This is so ornate, so decorative and, and exotic, the decoration, isn't it? Indeed. Very much North African, but with all those sort of connotations of empire yeah. and the East. Almost like the epitome of what the late 19th century person would think of as exotic. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of which, you mentioned tigers. Right. If you'd like to follow me, I'll show you where they lived. Down in the bowels, beneath the circus, a labyrinth. Right, it is in here somewhere, but it's, um, it's a bit of a maze down here. I'm beginning to worry Carl has no more clue than I do. Now, hang on, that's a cage. Now, this is a cage. I, we, I can't tell you what, was, what animals were kept in there. Well, there's, there's something big, because that's a big cage with a chain on the door. I don't know. So, Who knows? They could be hop hippopotamus. It wasn't guinea pigs, that's for sure. <laughs> here we go. This is it. Oh, that's a... What is that? Finally, we're here. A cage with a handle pull and a tunnel to the ring. The animals would have been behind here, and then when they were ready for them, they'd lift that up and they'd know to come out. But the tigers are gone. Animal acts thought exotic in days of empire are a thing of the past.